Lee, you talk about five fundamental problems of physics that are not only don't we know how to solve these problems, but they are they are so uh, critical to our understanding, and yet we we, we we think we know a lot, but we really don't know anything. <laughs> well, this is the nature of science. Science is the extension of our using rationality to try to understand the world that we're in. So we're always in a situation where there's a lot of secure knowledge behind us, but at the cutting edge, it may be that we have to question the foundations of that knowledge to make more progress. And we're in the midst of a scientific revolution. So in my view, you know, there's this mythical story that there was a revolution early in the 20th century, and then quantum mechanics was invented in relativity, and then the revolution was over. My sense is that the revolution never finished. That's what brought me into physics, actually. <laughs> and, um, and so we have no theory at the present time. We overthrew we. Einstein overthrew Newtonian physics with quantum physics, with relativity, especially general relativity. We have a theory of space and time and gravity and cosmology from general relativity. It works very well. We have a theory of atoms, elementary particles, molecules, materials, light in quantum physics. It works very well. But, but they're each partial descriptions. So we have no unified theory. We have no real theory. We don't know what, I don't know what to say to my kid, you know, when my kid becomes old okay. enough of, you know, what is the world really? Is it atoms? Is it space? You know, we don't know. So it's what is the most fundamental thing. If you go underneath all five of these problems, you're That's really asking real what problem. is the fundamental stuff. It's really about what is our understanding, what is our story about fundamentally what nature is, what is the nature of the world. So in, in essence, is we're, are we looking for, for what's the most fundamental stuff or, or principle or force that will, that will underlie all of the things that we find? I mean, It starts with principles. At least since physics has really been physics, it starts with principles. You know, the principle of the relativity of motion, that you can't feel it. And here we are in this situation, we're on a boat. Right. And what we're feeling, we bounce up and down, or if you know they, we hit too much sea and we get seasick, is acceleration. But you don't feel velocity. I mean, that's a great principle discovered by Galileo and Descartes. Became in, in, encapsulated in Newton's first law of physics, first law of motion. It became then encapsulated in Einstein's relativity principle when he applied it also to light and electricity and magnetism. Okay. So our most basic knowledge is encapsulated in principles. And, and, and uh, are those, those certainly work, but, but it's, not, it's not the stuff of matter and forces that we normally think are the most fundamental things. Now that's interesting, because there's a whole lot of questions about why do we have this kind of matter and not that kind of matter. Why, you know, and the properties, we know, you know, we know what the, to a certain level, we know what the elementary particles are. Electrons, neutrinos, and quarks, and then heavier versions of those. Right. Why those? And there's so many questions. Why is the electron one eighteen hundredth in mass of the proton, roughly? I think it's 1836. And the strength of uh, uh, gravity is how much less than electromagnetism? Why is the, the strength of gravity, you know, roughly 40 powers of 10? I mean, that's really a lie. It's 10 to the 38, but okay, less than um, less than electromagnetism. These kinds of questions, and roughly speaking, we have descriptions. We have theories that posit what are the elementary particles, what are the elementary forces, and they look very simple in a certain way. There are 12 kind of elementary particles, four forces, but then there's a lot of ignorance. There's a list of numbers that we don't know. If you like, dials that we get to tune on the theory. Yeah, free parameters that you, free have to parameters. Put, you have to put them in by hand, and yeah. then it works but you have all these numbers that don't seem to have any relationship to one another. Yeah. And you know, when I was, my first year of graduate school, in fact, just before I started graduate school, I went to a conference, and the standard model had been invented a few years before. The great gauge theory revolution had happened. So we greatly deepened our understanding of the forces. 
And Abraham Pice was one of the great yeah. old generation. He was a, and a wonderful person. He was, became a, a biographer of Einstein. Einstein and Bohr. He gave a talk and he said, you know, we've made great progress, but there's a list of questions we don't understand. Why is there a muon? Why does the electron have the mass it is? Why is the neutron heavier than the proton? That's that yeah. basic question. Why is it the neutron that's heavier? And why then just by a little bit? And he said, these have been the same questions since the 1920s, the 1930s. And in his whole career, they've just gotten redefined, you know, in terms of quarks rather than proton right, and right, neutron. Right. But those basic questions and, still remain. And they, you know, and, and, and I hate to say it, it's, you know, I'm probably not quite as old as, as Brahm Pice was then, but I'm getting there. Okay. And I have to say, you know, for my whole career, these have been the questions, and we don't make any progress towards well, answering them. Let's just talk about what the alternatives are. So, so what are the possibilities here? I mean, one is that there's some ultimate theory that can explain it all. Yes. Second, it's just uh, the way it is, uh, brute fact, as we say, and uh, like the planets. Well, as the philosophers say, the facticity of the matter. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it just is. Yeah, yeah. And the third is uh, some multi-universe theory that the, the there's every possible variations, and this is just the one that we happen to be in. The anthropic principle. Yeah, and that we see it because we're here, and that we think it's special, but it's not. And there's a fourth. What's the fourth? The fourth was understood more than 100 years ago by Charles Sanders Peirce, the great American pragmatist. Yeah. And he considered this problem. He considered the problem, what if science got to the point where we knew what the laws of nature were but we didn't know why these laws. Why these laws and not other right, laws. Right. And he said, above all, the question of why these laws and not other laws requires explanation, requires rational understanding. And he said the only possible rational understanding there can be to a question of why these laws and not other right. laws is that the laws evolved like, they evolved like a natural selection. Right. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but there's a beautiful quote of his, and he was certainly under the influence of Darwin that, that made a great impact on his theory. And I personally, I think that I, I agree with him. I think that we are at that point, and I think that the only possible answer is going to be something analogous to biological evolution. So that there is one answer, but that answer has not been that way from time immemorial. It is, it is something that has evolved, and at this point in time, we see what what it is now. Yeah, and one of the... But is that evolving according to some meta law? I mean... Boy, yeah. that's, the, <laughs> that's the key hard problem. It's one of the two key hard problems. The other one is what time is really in the context. Of, but look, when I was a kid, and for a lot of my career, until I encountered this, this worry, I thought that my job was to discover the true laws of nature which were timeless, which lived outside right, of time right, and right, space. Right. And I think that's what Newton thought, that's what Einstein right. thought. And and it's a it's an addiction. It's a, it's a pretension to aspire to the view of God outside the universe, seeing all of creation, the logic of creation. It's very hard and I think many of my friends and colleagues are under the sway of that, and I feel sort of like a recovered addict. I, I think that we've reached a time when that desire is in conflict with the evidence. The evidence from astronomy, from observation, is that the universe is always evolving, always changing, one. Okay. And so it may be in the laws yeah. themselves, as well as the, the unfolding of the universe. But more than that, okay, if we believe the laws never changed, then we can apply the, that is if we believe that the laws we need to explain what we see here and now are the only laws that have ever been, then we can use the singularity theorems of Roger Penrose and Steve Hawking to tell us that the universe began, that there was an initial singularity only 13.6 whatever billion years ago which is yesterday, you know, there's been life right. on the earth for sure. 3.8 billion years. Right. We see back 90 something percent of it, okay? And so, you know, it's like yesterday and we have to believe the universe started then. Well, if the universe started then, okay, then it's absurd to believe that laws of nature represent eternal truth because what could it possibly mean 
to have something be eternal in a universe that's only less than 14 billion years old. Or you have to believe that something else happened okay, to replace that initial singularity. And then you have other laws. Now, maybe those laws are really acting all the time in the background, and maybe they right. acted only then. The meta laws. Meta laws, we don't know. But um, either way, this notion, this comfortable notion of the deeper you go for knowledge, the more timeless you get, that comfortable notion okay. is getting challenged. And, and I think we should, I don't know the answer, but my sense has been for, you know, since I started thinking about this in the late 80s, the early 90s. And my sense has been that we have to, we are challenged, we have to think hard. And the only scientists who have found their way out of the kind of conundrums we face are the biologists. So I think we should talk to the biologists, we should listen to them, we should try to think about how they think.